Hello, Kurt Jackson, Retirement Income Strategist with KJ Financial here with this month's uh, continuing series on the myths about money. This week we're going to talk about housing and how house, houses are our, we consider those to be our biggest investment. And here's a little quote that I, I actually came up with, and it's don't buy that bigger house because you think it's a good investment. Buy a house in which you can comfortably make your home. And today we're going to talk about why that, that, that is the case, why I feel that's the case. Let's take an example here. Let's say we've got two houses across the street from each other that are basically the same floor plan, pretty much identical. And we have Mr. and Mrs. Huge Debt. They buy a $200,000 house, put 20% uh, down or $40,000 down. And then across the street, Mr. and Mrs. Max Down buy that same $200,000 house, but they put $100,000 down because we're always taught to put as much money down as possible and pay the house off as fast as possible, right? Because that's just the smart thing to do, the safest thing to do. That's what we've all been taught. Let's kind of delve into all of that uh, as we go through this. So let's assume after a year we had a nice appreciation in the house. Since they're the same house, basically, it went up $10,000. $10, so the new value after a year is $210,000. Is if we look at that as a return on the $200,000 asset, that's a 5% return, okay? It's the same for each house because they both were $200,000. But it's a 0% return on equity because we have Mr. and Mrs. Huge Debt who only put 20% down and Mr. and Mrs. Max Down who put up 50 put 50% 50 down. So the fact, the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Max Down put more down, had a bigger down payment, which makes them safer, right? But the house didn't go up more in value because they put more down. The house is going to do what the house is going to do no matter what you owe on it. So if we really want to dig into the numbers on this, if I put four, if Mr. and Mrs. Huge Debt put $40,000 down, they got a $10,000 gain out of that. Now, look, I know there's payments and stuff, and this is really just a basic way to look at it, okay? But if they, they put forty grand down and they had a $10,000 gain, that's a 25% return on investment. Whereas Mr. and Mrs. Max Down put $100,000 down to get that same $10,000 gain, that's only a 10% return on investment. So the less money we have into the property, the bigger our return on investment. Now, granted, as, as I mentioned, that doesn't take into account the house payment. We could go into the minutia of all that, but I'm just trying to get you guys to think about the house. And if we're going to look at it as, a, as an investment, then we need to treat it like an investment. And we don't, we don't tend to do that. So let's go on. So is the home our biggest and best asset? All right. Let's say in 1995, you bought a house for $220,000. And in 2007, if you had sold it, right, because that's when the market crashed, you could have gotten 380 out of it. Now, but you had to sell it, right? So just because it got up to 380 doesn't mean it was worth 380 because you didn't sell it, right? It's the same thing with your, your stock portfolios. You may have $400,000 in there, and you're, you had, you had $200,000 last year. You got $400,000 this year. You thought you have, you have 100, uh, you know, 100% gain, but do you? The only way you get it is if you cash out, because what if the market goes down 50% the next year? You're back down to 200, so you never really had that gain. All right, so over 13 years, we gained $160,000. So that's a 4.3% annual return. You know, nothing great, nothing, but it's nothing to get overly excited about, and it certainly doesn't make it our biggest and best asset. But there's more to the story because we've got homeowners insurance. And homeowners insurance, let's assume, is $1,000 a year over 13 years, right? That's $13,000. So now my net's really $147,000. Okay, that's a 3.8% return. But wait a minute, what about property taxes? Let's assume property taxes were $4,000, but we're in a 25% marginal tax bracket. They're tax deductible. So really our net is $3,000. That's still times 13, 13 years is $39,000. So that makes our net gain of $108,000, okay? Which is still good, but it's a 2.24% return. Is that something that you would consider your best and biggest asset? What else do we have to do over 13 years? We've got maintenance, right? So let's assume three grand for updated landscaping, five grand for a repair property uh, grading and drainage, ten thousand dollars to replace the roof, five thousand upgrade interior decorated, thirty-five hundred to replace half the windows, five thousand replace in air conditioning and furnace. 
none of those are out of, out of hand. We don't know what they'll be, but we're going to have some maintenance and some upkeep. So that's 31.5 total. Well, now my new net's 76.5. That's a 1.42% return. Okay. So that's really not a great asset. But wait a minute, it gets worse. Okay. Because when I sell it, I got to pay a selling cost. If we assume a kind of a minimal selling cost of 6%, saying we sold it at a hot time, it's another 22,800. So now my new net is 53.7 over a 13 year period on a on 200. I mean, I, I, my gain is only 0.88%. So the point I'm trying to make here is that your home is not really an investment or an asset. It's an asset, but it's not an investment. And even if we're trying to consider it as an investment, okay, how do you turn it into retirement income? You know, we always say how the buying a house that I got on my house, I own it free and clear. It's my retirement safety net. How is it your retirement safety net? Uh, okay, granted, if you own it free and clear, you don't have a house payment, but you still have taxes, you still have insurance, you still have maintenance. So it's not like you don't have a housing cost. You just reduced your housing cost, right? But if it's an asset or it's an investment, we've got to be able to turn it into income sometime, don't we? So how do you turn that house into cash? Well, there's really only three ways to do it. One is you sell it. Okay, great. So we sell it. But where are we going to live? Okay, we're going to have a cost to live somewhere. Do we buy another house? Do we rent? All right, whatever. It doesn't matter. We're going to have to find another place to live. You can get a loan. Okay, but do you want to be making a payment in retirement? That's really typically not what we like to do. And the third one is a reverse mortgage. Now, I know when people hear reverse mortgage, oh, my goodness, Kurt, that's terrible. And you're right. They can be terrible. But in the hands of a of a, a smart person working with a, an advisor that that knows what they're doing, it could be a decent strategy. Right. But I don't know how much of a safety net it really is. OK, uh, it, it just depends on your situation. So those are the three ways we can turn it into retirement income. None of them are really ideal. All right. Let's look at this. Take this a little deeper and let's see who's who's in a safer position in the house. OK, we're taught to put a big down payment down, try to pay it off as fast as we can, because that's the safest way to be in our house. So let's we get to, we're going back to our initial example with Mr. and Mrs. Huge Debt, and Mr. and Mrs. Max Down. Let's assume that Mrs. Debt and Mrs. Down are sisters and uh, their parents passed away and they got an inheritance, each ninety thousand dollars. Now, uh, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Huge Debt, they don't believe in tying up all their money in the house. So they're going to invest that money in a safe place where they have access to it, where it's not going to lose value. But Mr. and Mrs. Max Down think differently, and they're going to pay down their mortgage because the sooner we can get that house paid off, the safer we will be, right? So they pay their mortgage down from the $100,000 to $10,000. They use that whole inheritance. All right, well, let's say some, something bad happens, and they, all, they lose their job, so now they don't have that income coming in. Okay, who's safer? Now, Mr. and Mrs. Huge Debt have a bigger house payment. They have less equity, but they got $90,000 in a safe place that they could start to pull money out of to pay their bills for a while if they needed to. And they could really do that for probably quite a while on, on that. But what about Mr. and Mrs. Max down? I mean, so they lose their job. They can't make their house payment. Can they go back to the mortgage lender and say, hey, you know what? We just made a $90,000 payment. Can you float us a few months? What do you think the bank's going to say? Uh, no way, right? They're going to, you, you've got to make your house payment. So the fact that you owe $10,000 on a $200,000 house doesn't make it safer. Now, you could sell, but are you selling at the top of the market or the bottom of the market? Typically, when you're doing it in a, under this kind of stress, you're going to have to short, you're going to have to sell it cheap in order to get rid of it fast enough. So who's safer? Who has more choices? Who has more options? Okay. Who, which position would you rather be in in this, in this scenario? So one of the things that I did in my 20 years of mortgage in the mortgage industry is I taught people the two safest positions to be in your house is 100% financed and no and no mortgage. And actually, believe it or not, having 100% financing is safer if you had that money that you could have paid the house off with in a safe, liquid environment that earns at or above the interest that you're paying. Okay? It's as simple as that. And one of the reasons I got out of the mortgage industry is I couldn't find financial people that would actually put my clients' money in those places. Okay, so they kept them at risk, so they lost money. So it, it, what, when that happens, the plan doesn't work. If you don't take the money that you would have used to pay down the mortgage faster, it doesn't work. Okay, if you're not putting that into the investment, but there are better ways of owning your home. And actually, once you learn, you know, if you've got $200,000 in an account that's safe, that's earning at or above the interest that you're paying, you'll 
once you understand how money works, you'll never pay the house off because it's paid off on your balance sheet. Because I could write a check for 200 grand at any time out of that and pay my house off. But I don't want to because I'm being smarter with my money. I hope that makes sense. If not, you can always contact me. We can go into more detail on it because I know that's a foreign concept for folks. All right, so let's say we got a $150,000 house. We put 30 grand down on it, all right? Versus a $250,000 house with 50 grand down, okay? 20% down on each one. Really what we're talking about here is we keep trying to buy bigger houses because we think they're investments and it's a good investment to do that, all right? So uh, when I ran I ran this scenario back in the, when I was in the mortgage industry and at the time, the difference between a $150,000 house and a $250,000 house in Kansas City was typically it's a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage versus a four bedroom, three bath, three car garage, probably a thousand square foot difference. Okay. That was basically the, the, the difference. So let's compare these. All right. Assuming we can buy the $150,000 house, but we could have afforded the $250,000 house. So I've got 20 grand less down on the 150, but I had to put $20,000 more down. My after tax payment differential. Okay. I, I factored this over is $527 and 65 cents. If I put that in at a 7% return over 30 years, okay, assuming I can get that, that's after fees and everything, and I actually get that, it's $860,000, okay? And in the type of, of ve uh, vehicle that we put that in, financial vehicle we put that in, could create maybe about $60,000 a, a, a year in tax-free lifetime income. So what would it take for that $250,000 house to be able to go up at enough value to give you that in retirement, all right? I, I, we're not gonna look into that, but let's look and see what happens with the house, all right? So let's assume a 3% appreciation. So that means our $250,000 house is worth 606, almost 607,000. 3% appreciation on our $150,000 house is worth 364,089. So if I went to sell my $606,000 house, let's say we had 10% selling costs, paying the real estate agent, fix, you know, having to do some repairs and maybe paying some, um, some um, closing costs. And then I got to turn, turn around and buy the smaller house, the one that I could have been living in the whole time, right, for 364. So 10% selling cost. Uh, so my net's 182,000. So this, the better investment, right? Because a house is a better investment. So buying that bigger house gave me 182 grand. I'm continuing to follow traditional thinking because this is traditional thinking. At a 4% withdrawal rate, that gives me 7282 $7 dollars a year. Okay, so. Which one was a better deal? Which one was a better investment for retirement? Now, look, I know it's nice to live in a big house. I understand that, okay? But really, would, would your kids have grown up and been poor and not gone to college and been terrible kids because you lived in a $150,000 house instead of a $250,000 house? Yeah. Would your neighbors, would your family look down on you because you lived in only in a $150,000 house instead of a $250,000 house? And if they did... Who do you think is having a better retirement if you took that money that you could have on the $250,000 house and put it into a uh, an alternative retirement strategy, such as we're just kind of mentioning here, a hypothetical one that would have given you roughly 60 grand in a year in tax-free lifetime income on top of whatever else you did just because you bought less house? Was Would living in that four-bedroom, three-bath, three-car house be worth it to give up, what, $53,000 a year? For life and income and actually it's more because the 7282 would be taxable to a certain extent um all right so i don't just just a different way of looking at things so what we're trying to say here is that the house is not an investment it's a place to live it's a place to, it's a place to raise your family it's a home no matter where you live it's a home okay you make it your home but a house is not an investment it's a place to live now we're lucky in our market that pay, buying a home, owning makes more sense than renting. Okay, so um, in some markets it may not, but it, it. And I didn't do that comparison because we were just talking about the house as an asset, as an investment. So it's not going to give you much in retirement. It can actually cost if you're trying to buy more house because you think it's a great investment. It's going to cost you more in retirement. And really, what's going to be more important, living in that bigger house while you were while you were working and raising your kids, or having more money to do things with your kids and your grandkids and never having to worry about running out of money for the rest of your life. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in for this. Uh, if you have any questions, you get my contact information up there on the screen. Please feel free to reach out to me. We are different than traditional thinking, uh, and, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, 
we, we've got reasons why we do it, and we'll share those with you if you like. So uh, uh, thanks for tuning in. And if you like this, please share. If you find this valuable, please share the link with your friends, family, and, uh, and anyone you care about.